Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, welcome to the first plenary lecture, which is a joint event of the Congress of LMPS and the Logic Colloquium. And for this plenary lecture, we need a speaker who is interesting both for philosophers and mathematical logicians. And it's my pleasure and privilege to introduce our distinguished plenary lecturer, Johannes Franciscus Abraham Karel van Wentem, known also as, as Johan. <laughs> Johan van Bentem studied physics, philosophy, and mathematics at the University of Amsterdam and received there his PhD in 1977. After 10 years at the University of Groningen, he was appointed at the University of Amsterdam as professor in 1996 and university professor of pure and applied logic in 2003. He's a founding member of the Institute for Logic, Language and Computation. He retired from his position in Amsterdam uh, in September 2014, but continues his two other appointments, one as professor of philosophy at Stanford University, California, USA, and as professor of humanities in Tsinghua University, Beijing, China. Johan Fomentem is also a founding member of FOLI, the European Association for Logic, Language and Information. He was the chair of the program committee for the uh, Congress of LMPS in 1995 in, in Florence. He's known for his work on modal logic, temporal logic, dynamic logic, logic and information, cognitive science, structural proof theory, logic and computation, applications of logic to, to the syntax and semantics of natural language, logic and games. He's also interested in the history of logic, logic in India and logic in China. He has published uh, numerous uh, uh, number of uh, still countable number of books and at least 400 papers in, in logic and edited important handbooks. His special interest is logic and games. He published a volume logic in games by the MIT press last year and the topic of his lecture today is logic in play. So come here to play, Yuan. <clears throat> so um, is the microphone on now? Okay, so uh, don't think that this means that I'm just a zombie uh, uh, it's just so that the organizing committee sitting there can stop me occasionally or tell me to take back what I just said, right? Okay, so um, <clears throat> it's, uh, and I think, yeah, that's how it works. Um, <clears throat> okay, so first, uh, standing here as a, an opening speaker at a ceremony like this uh, gives me very strange feelings. Uh, my first Congress, uh, CLMPS Congress, was in Hanover in 1979 when I was a very young logician and uh, it was my first opportunity to actually s uh, get a sort of glimpse of what these famous logicians looked like. So I did go to the opening lecture in Hanover and to my great shame I must tell you that I cannot remember who the speaker was and I cannot remember a single sentence about the topic. But I do remember uh, one very vivid impression that has stayed with me, which was, my, that guy is old. <laughs> of course, what I realized now was that I wasn't just seeing the speaker, but I was also seeing myself 40 years later. So, so much for giving opening speeches at this conference. Of course, uh, I really appreciate the honor um, that... Um, uh, both the Logic Colloquium and uh, CLMPS have seen fit uh, to invite me for uh, giving this talk, and uh, I hope to be worthy of it. Um, 
there, but all that I think is self-evident. My final word is to the Finnish uh, uh, organizers and hosts. Uh, I've been to Helsinki a number of times. I feel a deep love uh, for uh, Finland, uh, Finnish logicians, uh, and so on. And unlike many of the speakers who have said nice things to you, I can actually prove how much I love Finland. Because I think all these speakers who have said all these wonderful things really are working with iPhones and so on. They've betrayed you. But the center of my life... ...is this 15-year-old Nokia cell phone. <laughs> Because I believe in solid traditional Finnish values. Okay. Having said that, let me uh, pass on to the topic of my talk. So, um, <clears throat> I'd like to talk a bit about uh, connections between logic, uh, games and agency. I'm going to do that in a, a light way. Um, and let me uh, start by uh, first making a sort of distinction. Um, <clears throat> If I think about uh, what logic can do or what it's good at, uh, at least two things come to mind, maybe a lot more, but at least the following two. One way of thinking about logic is that it actually provides languages for describing the structure of the world. So that means that the logical structure that we put into our systems is perhaps even in a very real sense structure of the world. So, for instance, one fact which you've just seen is that there is a Nokia cell phone in my breast pocket. What that actually implies, or maybe even there's another fact about my pocket, namely that there's not an iPhone in it. Well, maybe I should actually prove that to you, but you can probably see. There's no room. Okay. So, negative facts, conjunctive facts, and so on, could be part of the structure of the world. In that descript world descriptive sense, uh, logic would even be there, even if there were no human beings at all. So to speak, it would just be the structure of the world. But here's another view of logic. That it's actually that reasoning and argumentation are actually a structured social activity. So that we actually see uh, logic at work, maybe at its best, in uh, activities like conversation, argumentation, and so on. Now, I don't want to give the wrong impression. I'm not going to say that this is a deep divide. I'll say something a bit more about it. But it's just uh, two ways of looking at the subject. These two ways have been around for a long time in the history of logic. So, uh, if you look at my pictures. Um, Fries, I always used to think that Aristotle was firmly on the world descriptive side, because I used to think, and maybe I was even taught that, that the syllogisms are actually a system of categories which describes the way the world is structured. But talking to um, uh, Alan Code recently at Stanford, he said, John, you're so wrong. So Aristotle's syllogistic actually uh, was born in argumentation games. Aristotle make that point all the time. <laughs> and what syllogisms are about is actually, uh, they're very... This is one of these instances where... Oh, you can still hear me. Okay, I, I, I thought I heard a voice, like, saying that I'd gone too far. Okay, anyway, so that's Aristotle. Uh, another experience of the same kind I had recently at a conference we organized uh, in, in China. It was on the history of Buddhist logic in China. And actually the speaker said that um, these Buddhist logicians, uh, we're talking about the first millennium uh, of uh, our common era, had this annoying tendency that sometimes in the same text uh, they start by saying that logic is about the structure of the world, and by the end of the text they say that it's about argumentation. So he said, a bit confused. I said, not good enough. Can you still hear me? Okay, then there's just something with um, the echoes coming to me. I'll just keep going and uh, you just tell me when you notice something very unusual. parallel processing <laughs> that's known to be complicated not even these logicians here understand it completely um, so Buddhist logic the same sort of thing and uh, of course you could see it in, in other places too now I, I'm not aiming in this to 
further out. Yeah? Okay. So, um, <clears throat> I'm not trying to, to go, get into the discussion in this talk of what logic really is. Because actually I think there's nothing to choose between these two viewpoints. And, uh, uh, but it's just that for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to concentrate on the second aspect, not the first. Actually, uh, there is, of course, a whole line of discussion on what ro logic really is, but I'm with Elliot when he had the opening ceremony uh, that um, uh, uh, maybe the best definitions of subjects are the way they've developed rather than formula. Um, <clears throat> In fact, uh, to strengthen that point, this is just a, a small anecdotal aside. Um, Yoko here, for instance, uh, is an expert on generalized quantifiers. Generalized quantifiers is one of these topics that's very hard to classify for whether it's logic or linguistic. The Dutch logicians, um, sorry, when some of started doing generalized quantifiers, they were heavily criticized from inside this thing's no good. I, I, sorry, it's Finnish technology, so it's good, but So, yeah, my small anecdote, now it's taking too much time. In any case, so uh, my friend Franz Swartz, a Dutch linguist, was one of the first Dutch linguists who went to the generalized quantifiers, heavily criticized by his colleagues. Um, and of course, what they always say is, this is not linguistics. And then Franz came with a famous piece of logical argument, which we call the Swartz syllogism, which runs as follows, and uh, Elliot, you would appreciate this. Uh, it says, um, linguistics is that topic which is being pursued by the most prominent linguists. I am one of the most prominent linguists, <laughs> therefore what I'm doing is linguistics. Uh, the nice thing about this argument, which you can see as general methodological thinker, is that it applies to anything. So uh, feel free to use it. Now, um, let's uh, go on. Um, <clears throat> I wouldn't say that these different, there's many views of what logic is. I'm not going to push a particular one, I'm just going to talk about this uh, process view. Um, <clears throat> that these views are very uh, uh, compatible. For instance, uh, even in natural language, there is a very pervasive uh, ambiguity between talking about things in terms of what you might call processes or activities and products. And in honor of Hannes, I actually started musing about the title of a book by his patron saint, uh, Rudolf Carnap. So Carnap has this wonderful book called The Logische Aufbau der Welt, which means the, the logical structure of the world. And um, actually it suddenly struck me that at least in Dutch, this title is ambiguous between two readings. Read in one way, it actually means the, lo the logical structure in the world, the way the world is logically structured. But what it can also mean, at least in Dutch, is the logical construction of the world, the way we make it. And probably German has the same ambiguity. And this is not just with, uh, with Aufbau. You see it all through natural language. So I think of these things as complementary. Today I want to explore the process perspective. If you are interested in this process or activity perspective on logic, then you have to think about the actors who do it. And games are a natural prism for this purpose. So this brings me to my first topic, logic and games. I have to say about my lecture in general that I'm going to be very general. So there's going to be no theorems. Uh, it's a sort of ideas type lecture. I'm going to give a number of examples, which I hope uh, you may want to think about. And uh, all I want to do is, so to speak, develop an awareness of agents and uh, see where it leads. 
So let's start with one of the earliest cases in which logic and uh, games were brought together. And uh, what I'm talking about here is evaluation games for first order logic. Um, <clears throat> So think about statements with quantifiers. For instance, think about the following statement. Every Euro country has a coalition government. This just occurred to me uh, this morning. Okay, that's a for all that exists combination. Is it actually true? How could we put that to the severest? Actually, I don't know if it's true. I didn't think much about it. Um, but, how could we think about a severest test for that statement? Well, what we would do is we would give the, one, the universal quantifier to one person, let's say a challenger, who makes it as difficult as possible to see whether this statement is true. And then there's another player for the existential quantifier, the responder, who has to come up with the, the coalition government. So the, the all quantifier gets given to one player, the existential quantifier to another. This is a basic idea in thinking about logic as games. In fact, evaluation games for first order logic work like this. Uh, you play for formulas in models. Uh, it's played between two players, verifier and falsifier. And um, basically in the structure of the, form the, the formula is a sort of schedule for the game. If you have an or, the verifier has to choose because he's claiming that the disjunction is true, so come up with the disjunct existential quantifier. The verifier has to pick a witness, and uh, dually uh, the other two notions, conjunction and the universal quantifier, are uh, challenges given by falsifier. And negation is a role switch, so the two players are intimately related. This is just one example. Um, there's many more uh, game semantics for uh, logical systems uh, with much more intricate uh, games than this one, and uh, also many more game operators. But just to... If you want to think about an example, think about this network and think about this first order formula. So it basically says that every two points in this network, every X and Y, uh, are either directly connected by a directed R arrow R, or they're directed in two, uh, connected in two steps uh, with one intermediate point. You can think for yourself whether the, you think this is true or not in this uh, particular model. But the way you would play a game is that the falsifier, if, you, if you're a falsifier and you actually think that this is false, you'd have to come up with an example of an X for which the remaining formula is false, then come up with an example of Y for which the remaining formula you claim is false. After that, it's, the disjunction is a choice for verifier, and if verifier happens to choose the existential quantifier, she will also have to come up with a witness. Maybe by this time you have seen whether it's... So which player you'd like to be? Yeah, it's false. And uh, for instance, uh, what falsifier could do is, is actually choose the objects. Uh, this was late last night and I didn't have my book around. Uh, okay, two to three, for instance, is um, uh, two doesn't reach three and uh, neither in one step nor in two steps. Now these... Uh, <coughs> I'll go on. Oh, by the way, one uh, or two things about this particular game. I'll talk about its properties in a moment. One is actually that in my book I ascribe it to Jaco Hintika, who may not be here, but in honor of Finland. Uh, since that time, I've received comments from several colleagues, some of them present in this room, that they invented it before Hintika. I'm sorry about that. The book was in print. Uh, and maybe I should also point out a certain tendency in the scientific community. What I always find is that when I publish a book and it has a good idea, then lots of people step forward to claim credit. But when my books contain a bad idea, nobody steps forward to accept responsibility. Uh, this I find a very strange moral asymmetry in the behavior of academics. But okay, uh, this, let this be an aside. Um, <clears throat> now... Uh, let me continue about these games. Um, the basic feature of these uh, 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 games is as follows. A first order formula phi, uh, I drop assignments, is true in the model M if and only if. It's not that verifier always wins, but verifier has a winning strategy in this game. So many buttons. It's... Okay. Now, to some people, this lemma is actually the, the end of the whole game theoretic analysis. It's a sort of kiss of death. Because what it shows is that you can talk about games and strategies, but what it really just amounts to is truth. Okay, end of story. 
I think about it differently because it's a sort of bridge result. It bridges between the notion of truth and the notion of strategy in a game. And therefore, on that basis, we can start thinking about other things where logic and game theory meet. And I want to take you through a few examples. Let's first start with uh, logical laws like excluded middle. So we're, let's say a setting of classical logic, phi or not phi is valid. What does that mean? What it means is that in every model, it's verify who has a winning strategy for this. What's a winning strategy for verifier? That's a choice. It's a choice to play either the phi game or the not phi game. If I have verifier plays the phi game, well, that will be just verifier. And if she does that, she'd better have a, a winning strategy for the phi game. But what she could also choose is not phi, and then, because of what I just said, since the negation is a roll switch, it's actually falsifier who's going to start, everything gets switched. And in that case, so she's playing as falsifier, it would actually be to have to be falsifier who has the winning strategy. In other words, in unpacking the, cont the game theoretic content of excluded middle in this setting, uh, what this actually says is that these evaluation games are determined. And a determined game is a game where one of the two players has a winning strategy. Some people actually think those are not very interesting games because, you know, one, it's like being told by a teacher who knows everything, right? That there's nothing you can actually, interesting you can actually say by way of objections and so on. But nevertheless, there are games, and um, so that's determined games. Okay. Now, there's a very early result by... Uh, a person you all know, of course, uh, Zermelo, who dabbled a bit in set theory, but basically proved important results in logic and, logic and games. And <clears throat> uh, which is very early, I think it's from 1913. And what it actually says is that two player zero sum games with finite depth are determined. What do I mean by that? Well, two player is clear, like verifier and falsifier. Zero sum, uh, that's my generalization of it's only about winning and losing. Finite depth means that the history of the game is finite, so it will. Notice that this is true for these formula games because at every round you unpack uh, at least one quantif uh, operator from the formula, so you're going down by the operator depth. The proof of Semelo's theorem is actually interesting in a number of ways. One way you can think about it is that it's just excluded middle. For instance, suppose that you have a two-move game, just so depth two, and suppose that I read for all x there exists y, r, x, y as follows. For every move by x, the first player, there exists a move by the second player such that, and I interpret r, x, y as um, the first player wins, and the, wins the history x, y then what I've written to, for you there is uh, excluded middle unpacked. If I negate the first formula and then push the negation through the quantifiers, what I end up with is the second formula. And what that actually says is there exists a move for um, the first player such that for every move by the second player, it's not a win. I think I'm mixing up two things in my reading of the RXY. Um, and instead of trying to retrieve that, what I'll just say is either the second player has a response for every move by the first player, which makes the second player win, maybe I missaid that at the beginning, or there is a move by the first player such that whatever the second player does, the second player does not win, and notice we're in zero-sum games, that actually means that the first player wins. In other words, the way you can read that logical formula for games of depth two is Either the second player has a winning strategy or the first player has. Samelo so has an ingenious uh, solution method, uh, sort of coloring algorithm, which is the basis for lots of uh, still computational game methods. If you think about this more generally, there's much more logic to Samelo's argument. Uh, I'll just mention one thing, which is important, at least in my technical work. For instance, what <coughs> is really going on in games like this is that we're interested in a predicate capital win I. And capital win I, you should read that as uh, this is a position where player I has a winning strategy. And what my formula there says is that this is going to be the case if we're in one of three cases. Either we're at an end point and player I has already won. In that case, your strategy is sit back, relax, enjoy right, because you've won, or it's your turn, 
And you have a move, so these uh, brackets say there exists a move for I, such that you can bring yourself to a winning position, where you have a winning strategy. Or the third possibility is that it's not your move or player I's move, but it's the move of the other player J. But whatever J does, here it's a universal modality or quantifier, uh, you get to a winning position for I. Now you may not may, uh, think much of this definition, it's blatantly circular. And it also seems to say something uh, pretty unhelpful, namely, uh, what is your winning strategy? Go to a place where you have a winning strategy. <laughs> or, right. Nevertheless, uh, this is what logicians call recursion. Um, it's actually a benign recursion. It can actually be unpacked. That's exactly what Samelo's argument does. And it leads to an explicit solution for, um, for the game. And uh, these things can be studied, uh, for instance, in fixed point logics and so on, of the sort that computer scientists like. And that's actually my basis for saying that um, uh, often uh, when you think about logic and games, you also have to take uh, computer science on board. But let me now ask another question, which may be less obvious. Let's look at another simple logical law, because what I want to show you is that by thinking about the simplest logical laws, we get into deep waters in the foundation of game theory. Let's look at the law of propositional distribution. So something that seems pretty trivial in propositional logic. P and Q or R is, of course, equivalent to P and Q or P and R. If I think of the associated games, then actually, uh, here I've switched letters from verifier and falsifier to A and E. Sorry about that. Let's say that A, yeah, okay, I'm beyond this apology, I'll just do it. Okay, so the first player, A, that's the player who owns uh, the conjunction uh, in the, the, for that first formula, has a choice. He can go to P and let the game end there, or he can give the initiative to E, who controls the disjunction, and then E is going to decide whether we end in Q or in R. Okay, that's one game. Now look at the game for the second uh, formula. In this case, it's E who starts, because the main connective is a disjunction. After that, the initiative is given to A, in both cases, and A gets to choose between going to P or Q or P and R. Now let me ask a deep question in the foundations of game theory. When are two games the same? Would you think that these two games which are drawn for you here are the same game? Well, I see some no's happily. Uh, <clears throat> this very much depends on your point of view. There is a viewpoint in which the logical equivalence is actually right. So let me stay with, uh, uh, start with that. Distribution says that the two games are the same, and this is really true if we look at a rather rough level at these games, namely in terms of the powers that players have for determining outcomes. I'm not going to go through that argument in its entirety, but just to give you an impression. In the game to the left, A definitely has the power to make sure that the game ends in P. Right? Because that's one strategy that he has. He can go left and it's over. A has the same power in the game to the right. Of course, he has to wait what E does, but every time after E has played, he can always go to P. So that's a power he also has in the second game. Now, another power that A has in the game to the left is that he can give the initiative to E. By doing so, he makes sure that the game ends in either Q or R. He cannot determine it further than that because the further choice is up to E. But that's also a power that A has in the game to the right because he could play his strategy, play Q on the left-hand side and play R on the right-hand side, and then, depending on what E does, the game is bound to end in Q or R. Well, with a few more twists, this power analysis will actually show you that the games are the same. But if there's one thing we know as mathematicians, and I hope also as philosophers, usually questions of when are two things the same don't have a unique answer. It really depends on your point of view. And when I saw you, for instance, uh, you know, disagreeing, I could also give a reason for saying that these are not the same games. For instance, notice that if you look at the actual how of how the games are played, uh, the situation is very different for the two players. Um, 
traces in the game to the left, there can actually be a situation where E has a choice between making the game end in Q or R. Right? That happens there. I mean, that note for E in the game to the left. There's no such situation in the second game. She never has that choice because whatever she chooses, there's always the possibility of P. Right? If you let A go on. So if you look at finer details of the choice structure, then it would be different. So if you look at the how of how the games are played and players' actions and choices, then game invariance would be different. It wouldn't be about powers, but more like, uh, well, for the cognoscenti uh, modal process by simulation that can uh, stimulate st uh, strategies. Okay, I'm telling you nothing new here, although you may not have thought of this in the course of game. But, um, of course, we're back to the 19th century. So um, it was a sort of key insight in the foundations of mathematics that when you structure any topic uh, <coughs> in a mathematical sense, what you actually have to think about is invariance under various transformations. Uh, for instance, in geometry, uh, if you're looking at the Euclidean transformations, you get the rigid structures of Euclidean space. If you take uh, other classes of transformations, for instance, you might get into much uh, uh, higher description levels, such as topology or other uh, ways of uh, mathematically legitimate ways of looking at space. Uh, by now, you have recognized, uh, of course, these two people here, or you should. Uh, uh, the one to the left is Helmholtz, who first uh, came with this idea, and the one to the right is Felix Klein, who 20 years later or so uh, actually introduced that idea more systematically in mathematics in the Erlanger program. So there can be different natural levels of identity for games, for anything, but also for games. That also means that in principle, when you bring logic and games together, uh, you have to think about what level you want to do it. And this may, it may be, as an aside, also allow me to say something about uh, uh, doing logical analysis of anything. This is an excursion. So most people I know who are not logicians uh, and who don't like logic actually think that logic is a sort of organized form of pedantry. So there is some sort of reasoning practice, and what logicians do is uh, they write it in formulas and then they start digging deeper and deeper into the details. So you just said that uh, some sentence follows from another sentence, and the logician says, yeah, but if you really look at the details of that, I'll write them in formulas, and then there's 10 proof steps that take you from here to here, right? So more and more detail. And maybe at the utmost limit of that, everything has been written in a way in which a mathematical theorem prover would understand it. That's the deep zoom level of logic, <laughs> where you look at the most detailed version of arguments. Uh, on that view, the role of logicians is a bit like moles and other animals that live under your feet, right? So they try to, they claim they're doing foundations, although, of course, what moles are mostly doing is messing up, uh, you know, the soil on which you're standing, okay? But I want to point out that logic is not at all confined to that style of thinking, because logical languages and logical thinking just as well allow us to go up to take a reasoning practice, but look at it from above, so to speak, only pick out a few patterns in a very simple language and see things not because they're more detailed, but because they're less detailed. A good example for this, again, in logics of space, is the topological interpretation of modal logic. Uh, modal logic and modal S4, as Starsky pointed out, is the complete theory of the interior operation in topology. That's an outrageously high level look at topology, but very illuminating. In that second sense, logicians are like birds flying high above you in the stratosphere and seeing patterns in what you're doing that you wouldn't notice. Okay? End of excursion. So we can be both bowls and birds. And I think we should try to be both. Now, in these examples, there's an entanglement, I would say, in two directions. Logic and games form a natural combination. I started with something very simple, first-order logic, and um, I hope I've shown you that by thinking about first, simple laws in first-order logic, um, we immediately get into deep questions about games. There's actually two aspects to this, if you think about it more. Um, one way is actually that you can use logic to analyze games. In that sense, you keep logic fixed, but you try to throw some new lights on games, so to speak, through logical insights. 
The other direction, and actually my examples are a bit ambiguous between that way of thinking, is from games to logic, because, for instance, in these evaluation games, you could actually say, I'm using games to explain a basic notion in logic, not the other way around. And of course, you could iterate that as well. Um, for instance, it's quite possible to have logics of games for logics. For instance, what I just said about some, and they don't need to be the same as the original logic. For instance, uh, evaluation games for first order logic have a Zermelo solution, when I think of them as games. The Zermelo solution has to be described in fixed point logic. That means that the logic of these Zermelo games is one level up from first order logic, and I don't even know where all these hierarchy ends. Now, my main topic for today is logic uh, of games, although uh, this slide was just to say that uh, logic as games is also a very interesting topic. It's also in my book, and instead of saying anything about it, I'll show you two pictures of major people in that area. I, I hope I'm not insulting anyone. The person to the left is Paul Lorenzen, a German logician who in the 1950s uh, started thinking about this much, and to show you the kinder, mo uh, gentler, modern face of uh, logic as games, I put a picture of Samson Abramsky, but I could have put many more. Now I want to broaden a bit. So I'm talking about games as my model for agency. I want to talk about logic in the analysis of games. Games are played by agents. So if we want to think about that, we have to think about what the agents who play games actually do. These agents display a wide range of abilities. And I claim uh, they can all be studied in logic. We'll explore, explore just a few basic features of this. And well, actually, I think my slides are pretty well designed. You can just let me talk. And if you read what's on them, you actually get the main message. Okay. <clears throat> let me start with one of the first things that strikes uh, me if I think about um, a game and some game-like situation. It's the, the variety of activities that agents uh, are actually involved in. So um, uh, maybe many logicians think that uh, uh, inference is maybe the only serious informational activity, but that can't quite be right, because in many natural scenarios there are more things that actually come together, and very often inference only works in the setting of other informational acts. Standard example, go to a restaurant. You can see it everywhere in Helsinki, well, any country. Three people order drinks, water, beer, and wine. A new waiter comes in with three glasses. Question, what do you see in a restaurant? There are six ways these three drinks can be distributed over these three people, if you think about it for a moment. Although my students often say eight, two times two times two, which is wrong. How does the waiter solve that? He has an informational problem. Which drink belongs to which person? Well, what you will see is that the waiter first asks a question. For instance, he will ask, who has the beer? Once that's answered, he actually puts down the beer and looks at the remaining two things. In information theoretic terms, by getting that question answered, he has reduced the space of six options to only two, because the only remaining question is, uh, how is water and wine distributed? For that, he needs one more question, uh, which he asks. And then uh, in the restaurant, what you will see is um, that the last thing he just solves by an inference. It just follows that the remaining thing he has in his hand goes to the other person. Aside. I once explained this to the president of the University of Amsterdam, this example, and he was appalled. He said, Johan, you're really going to the wrong restaurants. I pay about 200 euros for a meal, and I don't want to be that third person who doesn't get a question. <laughs> okay, so he didn't like the asymmetry in, the, in this example. So knowledge comes from many sources. There's lonely thinkers like Rodin's uh, thinker who maybe would do everything by inference. Then there are thinkers like Sherlock Holmes, who actually, if you read the stories, uh, do a lot of deduction, but they also do fact-finding, so they perform experiments. Well-known example, of course, also in the work of Jaco Hintika. And I also put the restaurant, uh, because that's even questions, conversation, and communication. This threefold view of informational action was already around in early Chinese logic. So I have a quote for you, 
uh, in modern Chinese characters, Ji Wen Shuo Qin, and pronounced incorrectly without the tones. And what that actually says is that knowledge, that's the first character, comes from, and there's three sources. The first is hearing. So that's hearing something from others. So that stands for communication. So asking a question, getting an answer. The second is Shuo, means demonstration or proof. So that's inference. And the third is Qin, which stands for experience, but you could think of that as, for instance, observation. Uh, so this idea, uh, so my point here is just, there's a variety of tasks, and I also claim that these things can be modeled in logic. By the way, notice the elegance and compactness of the classical Chinese formulation, four characters. I was reminded of the passage in the Griefschrift where Frege uh, actually says that he had considered using natural language for his logic, but he had refrained from doing this after thinking about it because of the prolixity of natural language. But, ladies and gentlemen, the natural language he was thinking of was German. If Frege had known classical Chinese, who knows how the course of logic would have gone? Okay. Good. I, uh, <clears throat> Another basic feature which you already see in the question case, in, in, which is also very relevant to games, is that much of the reasoning and other informational actions that we do um, is actually not just concerned about facts of the world, it's about what we know about others. So it's truly multi-agent and social how our reasoning usually works, in practical settings at least. And um, you can already see that with a question. <coughs> For instance, when the waiter asks a question, but you could also think about questions in general, he actually does convey some information, namely that he doesn't know the answer. And he may also convey other things so, for instance, that he thinks that the people he's asking the question to do know the answer. That's actually knowledge about knowledge and ignorance of others. That's just as important in our reasoning and in daily life, in holding everything together, as reasoning about facts. And I think it's very important to keep that in mind. Again, I'm going to give you a standard example. Here you can test your own ability in this sort of reasoning. So is by now. I think of this example as just as basic as say, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, Socrates is mortal. It's just about social reasoning. And maybe also more interesting than all men are mortal and Socrates is man and so on. Okay, so here, here you go. John, Mary and Paul get one card each. It's from the colors of the Dutch flag. Red, white and blue. So John gets red, Mary gets white, Paul gets blue. Mary, who has the white card, doesn't know, of course, uh, how red and blue are distributed. And she asks John, do you have the blue card? That's what she asks. I'm asking you, who knows what after this question? Test your ability for social, logical reason. Uh, John knows, yes. Why? Um, from the question, John can figure out that Mary doesn't have the blue card. Therefore, since, you know, since he knows that he has red, he knows that Mary must have right. That's true. So John knows. Now, of course, you're an adult, so you may think, yeah, but maybe it was just a trick question. But we actually ran this experiment with children. Children are always good for experiments because they don't do trick questions. Right? So they're much better subjects for reasoning than uh, professors or students. Or... Okay. John knows. The others don't. Now John answers no. no because of, you know, he doesn't have the blue card. Who knows what now? Well, John, of course, knows how the cards are because he already knew. Who else? Yeah, Mary knows because she has the white card. She knows that John doesn't have the blue card. What about Paul? Were you saying something? Oh, so somebody says Paul knows as well. I don't think so. But thank you for starting the... Um, well, you see, it, look at it from Paul's point of view. So the information given by the question that Mary doesn't have the blue card is no new information for Paul because he has the blue card, so he already knows that. Right? So there's no information in Mary's question. 
the fact that John answers that he doesn't have the blue card is not informative either, <laughs> because, <laughs> right, he already knew that because he has the blue card. So he doesn't get enough information. I'll make this precise in a moment. But there is something that Paul does know. Assuming that Paul is equally clever as this collected audience of logicians and philosophers of science, what does he know? That the others know. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> so he has actually learned a lot. He just hasn't learned how the cards are. Now, my claim is that all such sort of things can be modeled in logic. So what I've drawn is a few diagrams for you here, which you don't have to go through in details. But the initial situation is given in the diagram to the left. So there's eight, eight possi uh, sorry, six possibilities for the ways these cards could be distributed. That's like in the restaurant. What these lines indicate are uncertainties. So, for instance, when you compare RWB with... Um, uh, who cares, RWB on the top line uh, with RBW, I'm putting an uncertainty for one because one has the red cards but doesn't know whether the rest is white, blue or blue, white and same explanation for all the other lines. After Mary answer, uh, asks her question, out of these six possibilities, two disappear, namely the ones where Mary has the blue card. That's what I've done in the second diagram. So we go from six to four options. And if you now look at the situation in that diagram, for instance, you can see why geometrically that player one knows the cards because we are in fact in the top situation, red, white, blue. And in the top situation, you see an uncertainty that's in the middle. Maybe I should try to, well, okay. I'll keep using natural language. Uh, so if you look at the top situation, you see uncertainty lines for players two and for player three, so they don't know the cards, but you don't see an uncertainty line for one, one knows. And if then the information is given that John doesn't have the blue card, we end up with a situation on the right, where as you can see, uh, all uncertainties have disappeared for one and two, but three still has this uncertainty between the two cards, but what you can see everywhere is that the others are not uncertain. Okay. So I claim you can model these things in logic. By the way, some of you may have seen this recent internet discussion. Puzzles like this are actually a form of logic that attracts huge attention on the internet. So in recent months there was this Cheryl birthday puzzle, which went viral. It was in a game show in Singapore, 50 million downloads, even more than your methodology course, Hannes. Uh, uh, and, uh, <clears throat> okay. Lots of discussion about the correct, uh, uh, about the correct uh, solution and so on. Uh, lots of newspapers published about it. Um, this is actually very satisfying. It means that people like this sort of social reasoning uh, of this style. It also means that occasionally on the internet they discuss serious issues. Okay. You can actually do these things, uh, but I, I'm not going to go into any details of this, in dynamic logics of information. All basic informational acts uh, satisfy precise logical actions. I only want to make a point about the form of these actions. Um, uh, what they will actually describe, if you look at the formula like the one in the middle, is actually for instance, what an agent would know after the information came in that phi is the case. That's uh, the action denoted by that exclamation mark phi. And to the right, that's actually explained in terms of what the agent would know beforehand. Um, <clears throat> laws like this and uh, logical systems like this have actually ar arisen again through joint efforts. So the basic logic of knowledge we actually owe to Jaco Hintika. And here's Hintika's picture. But the basic epistemic logic of Hintika only describes the following. Suppose that you know something, what else do you know without doing anything? Maybe some deduction. But these dynamic logics actually say, suppose that you know something and some informational events takes place, which you represent explicitly, what would you know afterwards, so to speak? That extends it, and the extension is actually a sort of dynamic idea from computer science, and I put a picture of one of the computer scientists in this area that I admire highly, Robin Milner. All these systems can be done in modal logic, but uh, let me check that. Small point here for the mathematical logicians in the audience. Uh, many people, when they see these logics, get very nervous because they think, well, these formulas don't look like the sort of logical actions that I'm used to, so shouldn't we quickly reduce them to uh, standard logical things and so on? 
I would want to say, no, uh, there's no reason to do that, because when we, for instance, look at this social reasoning and other things, the mathematical methods of logic still apply. They just work in a broader realm, and the information dynamics that I'm talking about has logical laws, which I see on a par with other laws, and they just extend our usual repertoire. So they work in a messier and noisier world, but they still use the methods of them. So in other words, the, f the saints, so to speak, of uh, these extended notions of logic are still traditional ones. So I can assure you that every evening, like most of you in the logic colloquium, I get down on my knees and I pray to Euclid, Frege and Gödel. Okay. However, if we think about... Um, <clears throat> Uh, games, there's much more to it than pure information processing. Um, what, it, what they also involve are uh, notions that you wouldn't normally expect in a logical se setting, namely uh, agents' preferences and beliefs. Let's look at an extremely simple game. Uh, a number of you will have seen this. It's, it's, a, it's a sort of standard example I often use. Here's a game. It's a bit like your P, Q and R game. So first player A can, can choose to go left. In that case, uh, A gets a payoff of 1 and uh, E gets nothing, that's a zero. Or A can give the initiative to E. If E then goes left, A gets nothing, but E gets 100. And if E goes right, they both get 99. What's going to happen in this game? Or how could you think about that? Well, let me explain the standard game theoretic take on this. That's the method of backward induction. It would think about this game as follows. You first put yourself in the position of E. It's a bit like the Zermelo algorithm, it works bottom-up. E just has a classical decision problem. If she goes left, she gets 100. If she goes right, she gets 99. So obviously she's going to go left. That's my thick line, right? That's, uh, so, so that's the, uh, the predicted choice for E. She's going to go to a place where she gets more. Now put yourself in the position of A. If A thinks about it in this way, when he compares his two moves, he thinks, well, if I go left, I get one. If I go right, I'll get nothing. Therefore, going left is preferable over going right, and therefore I've put a thick line there. That actually means that this game ends in the outcome 1-0, which is, of course, rather remarkable, given the fact that they could have gotten 99-99. Maybe, you know, you won't have time to think about it in this lecture, but many of these slides, you could also think about it for a few hours. Maybe even write a paper about it, because uh, there's a lot of structure to this reasoning. And in fact, one of the things uh, you would do in logical analysis of games is actually trying to get at the reasoning underpinning this prediction, and maybe also see variations. Notice, for instance, that A's actions are based, just to give an example, it's not just a preference, but a belief. Because by the very fact that A goes left, he'll never find out what E is going to do. Right? So it can only be a belief about what she's doing, because he won't know. <laughs> right? Once he's gone left, it's over. Well, this is a technical slide, which uh, I just put here to impress you. Uh, so it's actually possible to think about what makes this backward induction style of uh, uh, thinking work. There's in fact a lot of work in logic and game theory on this by Alman and many others. Uh, uh, the only point of this slide is to say that if you actually uh, analyze this backward induction algorithm as an algorithm in fixed point logics, you'll actually get a logical form which uh, looks like what I have here. Um, I just keep talking until, until you're properly impressed. You've been properly impressed. Uh, uh, that form has positive syntax uh, for uh, the, the recursive definition of the strategy. That means that it's actually definable in fixed point logics. And again, we're in business in standard logical systems up to the higher standards that mathematical logicians would like. So we can define the backward induction uh, uh, um, uh, uh, algorithm, we can reason about it, and we can derive the properties that it has uh, through logical means. But in addition to this, uh, players, uh, I, I go to a more general level, players can do much more. In fact, the way I think about games is that um, there's actually um, three phases. There's what you do before the game is played, that's what you do during the game, and what you do afterwards. What you do before the game is deliberation. So you think about what you might be going to do. And that deliberation has a clear logical structure. 
to me, backward induction, in fact, belongs there. It's a deliberation procedure. So it tells you beforehand what you would expect. But of course, in the course of a game, uh, maybe things don't work according to backward, backward induction. Maybe, to your surprise, you find out that it works very differently. To go back to my example, suppose that in fact in this game, uh, these dark lines are now A's expectation. What actually happens is that A plays to the right. Okay? So suppose that we're now in that point where E has to play. Well, that's a deviation from backward induction. Your prior deliberation has somehow failed. Things are not going the way you expected. What is E to make of that? Well, this is pretty open-ended, also in the, in the current game theory, because now you have to make assumptions about how to interpret what you actually see in the game. That may have to do with what sort of player you're up against. Some people in the literature believe that deviations from battle reduction are mistakes. So you're just playing against a stupid player who's playing against his own interest. But it could also be that A is um, uh, trying to signal something. He's taking a risk by going right, because he might get nothing. But by signaling that he's willing to take that risk, he's actually conveying information about what type of player he is. And if the game were longer, uh, then he might actually uh, you know, act on that signal and so signal something of her own, and so on. And of course, the last possibility is that uh, I'm looking at uh, Dietmar, for instance, maybe A is just an automaton and you know, it's just one move and always goes right, right? Maybe we're in a sort of Turing setting uh, uh, and um, we're playing against the machine. Okay. But the, all that doesn't take us out of logic. It will just make the logic more interesting because we would now have to deal with surprises, revising our beliefs about the players that we got through deliberation, and we may have to form hypotheses about the types of players we're up against. Again, existing logics uh, are up to this task, and in particular, the belief revision, which may have to happen during a game, uh, by now I think is pretty well understood. Um, uh, so there's various informational signals that come in that may actually go against the beliefs that you had beforehand. And again, uh, just for your information, I've written a few laws that you could actually look up in the literature. The first formula describes what an agent I would believe after getting the hard information that finds the case. Hard means totally reliable. The second, more complicated formula describes what an agent would believe, if the, even what conditional beliefs the agent would have if he got soft information, which means information that makes far more plausible. Beyond that, I'm not going to say anything. I think that would be tedious for an opening lecture of a conference. The upshot is that logical laws can describe new beliefs as new information comes in, and that new information can come in in a great variety of formats. But there is a more general point to me here. Because why do I think of this as being important to logic and to how we think about what logic can do? Well, I think to many people, logic is a sort of total guardian of correctness, and that maybe the best way of using logic is to stay in a realm where everything is correct. So uh, you, have, uh, you start from facts that uh, you, uh, you know, ho hold on to, and then logic is not going to make things worse. It's, it's, it's actually going to stay there. But I actually think that belief revision is an extremely interesting process, and it's a process of correction. So in a slogan, our abilities in games, but also much more widely, show, show you maybe even better, not so much in always being correct, because that doesn't tell you much about an agent, but what, how an agent corrects himself. Now I'm at a CLMPS point. Who made that point first? Not a logician, but a philosopher of science, namely uh, Karl Popper. Of course, it's a typical Popperian point, that what we're actually doing is learning by trial and error. The first person who brought this in logic is Peter Yernenfors, my second picture, and uh, people who are very much into making learning through correction um, uh, 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 important are people like Brian Skirms and Kevin Kelly, uh, who, again, are a bit hard to determine whether the logicians are philosophers of science, and in fact, who cares? Right? Because it's the topics that are important. Okay, this slide I'm going to stop. Well, this ends with this sort of picture of um, what I call theory of play. So when we take the agency seriously in logic, then um, we'll actually find uh, a lot of challenges. 
we get a much greater variety of logical tasks than we normally look at. We have to look at the laws that they satisfy, and we even have to envisage the different kinds of agents. Logic also works outside of pure settings, like maybe the foundations of mathematics, although, of course, that's an important area, but the right laws may be a bit more subtle to find. I have five minutes left, and uh, it's still a lot of slides, so I have to choose a bit. Um, maybe this is an example of correction. So let's see how intelligently I uh, uh, approach this. So the agency perspective, which I've given to you here, you could think of that as a way of doing logic, but it's actually a way of thinking about lots of things. One of them I've already uh, uh, mentioned. It would put, if you really look at what happens in games, instead of foundations, it would actually put correction and, uh, at the center of things. And that's actually what I nowadays believe. I think that the best test of people's logical abilities is actually to see what they do in a situation where mistakes occur and how they then retrieve the situation. Just as I think, that, and not so much in mathematical proof. Because to me the analogy would be, in mathematical proof, that's a bit like an area you don't like in church. You don't find out much about people's moral fiber by looking how they behave in church. You do find out a lot about, about people's moral fiber by looking at what they do in nightclubs. Okay? Same thing here. So I think no. these points also apply to natural language. Uh, this, this agency perspective, uh, I'm going to skip that. Um, maybe I'll make one point about game theory. Uh, if we pursue these various uh, uh, threads that I've given you before, you will actually see that lots of questions come up that haven't been solved, both in the foundations of game theory and of logic. For instance, if these players are so important, then you might also think that the very notion of game identity is at stake. I talked about these various levels of looking at games, but notice that my examples didn't involve beliefs or preferences. But suppose that we have real players who play these games. Shouldn't we then also be thinking about how they play the games? Shouldn't we be thinking about identity of games as played? And I'll just give you one simple example to chew on. Let's apply the distribution law that I gave before for propositional logic to my example that I have there. So it has the same form as P and Q or R, but I put these payoffs. Now what I've done in the second game is I've just performed distribution. So notice, right, E has moved on top, there's a choice for A, and I've put the outcomes in the same order you would do in the propositional distribution law and uh, I put the, uh, the payoffs in the right way. Now compute backward induction for this second game. In the second game, you're going to see that on the left for A, he's going to go to 1, 0, because that's best for him. In the uh, right sub-game, he's going to go to 99, 99, because that's best for him. E can see this coming, so if she goes left, she gets 0. If she goes right, she gets 99. So this time, the solution is going to be that E goes right and A goes right. Notice it's totally different from what happened in the first game. In other words, game equivalence under preference, <laughs> at least for rational players, so to speak, is very different from propositional preference. Open problem, uh, I think, maybe both in game theory and in propositional logic. What sort of equivalence would this be? So... The end of my talk was actually about uh, logic meets reality. I won't have time to talk about uh, much of that, but um, I'll just say uh, one thing and then I'll really end. With a talk like this, you might think, well, so, okay, even though there's this emphasis on that is still logic and that we're just talking about agents that's extending the scope, the whole phraseology and the way of talking about things starts sounding pretty empirical, as if it's about reality. <laughs> right? Take my cards example. I'm asking you, well, do you think we've actually also run experiments with the card example and so on? And that, of course, fits in a trend because nowadays I think logic meets reality more and more. It's a source of computational devices that change our worlds, like uh, computers. Of course, Moshe has a wonderful talk about this. Logic nowadays meets the empirical facts of human cognition. Right? That's, uh, th th there's a lot of research going on at the borderline of logic and cognitive science. And if you are into reading Danish literature, although maybe people in Sweden and Finland don't, uh, 
uh, I guess taking Lund from the Danes still rankles. Uh, anyway, if you were into reading Danish literature, for instance, you might know a book like Info Storms by uh, uh, Vincent Hendricks, which is actually about applying logics to the needs of the current uh, crisis and information society. Now, I want to end uh, not with examples of that, but with just one point which uh, people often see as a sort of objection to um, the, the, the sort of uh, perspective that I've been given. And that is, Johan, your talk is becoming terribly confusing between that great, wonderful divide we all learn as philosophy students, namely normative and descriptive. Logic is normative, so it describes how things should be. And cognitive science deals with descriptive things, how people actually reason. Recently, a little film was made at our institute, not as beautiful as the one of Helsinki University, and it was a little propaganda film for the ILLC as a research uh, uh, spare point or something of the University of Amsterdam. So I actually organized a few people to say something. Of course, you always have to hope that they will stick to the party line. And actually, there was one very unfortunate incident with uh, one of our PhD students, because he spoke on camera, and he said, well, one of the big things is that Johan now wants us all to say that logic is also empirical, but personally, I think it's normative. It just tells people what they should do. Fortunately, this was cut from the documentary. <laughs> Although I'm afraid it's still available in, in some electronic version. But this student really seriously misunderstood me. And uh, so what I want to say is this is another thing you might want to think about. It is true that these agency topics are at some sort of borderline of actual behavior and logic. But I think that's a very natural and healthy borderline where you actually expect a lot of traffic. So one is, all the logics that I would study in this area are normative, but my choice of topics, so to make these logic relevant, that's informed by what actually happens. I could study a million of things, so to speak, but what sets the agenda is actually thinking about what, what agents actually do. So these perspectives belong together. And moreover, in my emphasis on correction, again, description is going to meet normativity. When I say that something is behavior where an agent corrects himself, I need a norm, right? Correction itself is not a descriptive notion. That, uh, I can only call something a correction by thinking about a norm. So I think the reality of this sort of work actually, uh, in a philosophical word, transcends the normative descriptive boundary. Uh, it's a little bit of both, and nothing is gained by being very strict about it. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I've reached the end of my talk. Uh, of course, the obvious conclusion is that I hope that I've shown, uh, hope to have shown that taking a sort of agent perspective uh, through logic and games and then thinking about its further implications is a worthwhile view of looking at what logic can do and maybe even what logic is. So that's what I say on this slide. However, I also started by... Um, and pointing out, uh, by contrasting this view, by a view of a world which would just have logical structure of itself, logical structure that would even be there if there were no agents around at all. And you may have thought, Johan doesn't like that. So what he wants to do is populate the world with agents so that everywhere there's talk and chat and so on. But that's not true. Occasionally, like this was taken three days ago in Cape Breton Island, I actually think that a world free of agents is the most beautiful world to be in. Thank you very much. This is very lively lecture. We have now 15 minutes for discussion, and please, who would like to raise a question? There, and there are microphones which were uh, carried around. Yes, uh, you have. Uh, you mentioned somebody. Uh, you mentioned somebody. Uh, who did the same work as Hintika independently, right? Now, you know very well that person was me, and I worked with John Mayberry in Bristol and with Dick De Jong, whom you probably know, right? 
But unfortunately, I didn't publish the work at that time. Many years later, I could, there was a friend of mine whose 50th birthday was coming up, and I sent the paper to that 50th birthday volume, and who was that friend? It was you. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, you just noticed a logical phenomenon. Uh, Rohit has just converted a de dicto reference to him by me into a de re reference <laughs> to him by himself. But you're absolutely right. Rohit is one of the persons who's actually, you. Uh, you know, uh, very important to you. Yes. Okay. Uh, me here. Yeah. Johan. Uh, hi. So, um, as you know, I'm also very sympathetic to the agent-based and multi-agent-based perspective of logic. But as I've been thinking about these things over the last years in my VD project, I came to realize that there's this, there's that we should be talking more about uh, adversariality and cooperation in these games. And in particular, that many of the most interesting games that we have, that we're talking about, are w games where you have an interesting combination of adversariality and cooperation. Because you might say, oh, some games are purely adversarial, some games are purely cooperative. That's true. But in my, you know, one, one thing I've come to believe is that the interesting games are the ones where there's an interest, there's some complex interplay between adversariality and cooperation. And this is just something I'd like to hear you, yeah. your thoughts on. Well, uh, Katarina, I, I couldn't agree more. So uh, I would think most games, or the most important games, have this mixture. So for instance, to go back to my example, right, the, the, the simple one I gave, game the from game theorists I often get the following answer. They say, well, you know, it's very simple. Air is a competitive game, and then you should stop whining about backward induction solution, or it's a cooperative game, <laughs> and then it gets right, right. And then my answer is, yes, but the problem is that those games almost never occur, <laughs> right? And that the games you really play uh, are a, a, a complex mixture. Good example, Katarina, just to elaborate on your point, academic life. In this room, we're all colleagues, we cooperate. But at the same time, if you had the idea earlier than somebody else, you would quickly rush to the JSL and get it published. And if your submission was even there one second before his, it would be your theorem. The laws of, are very cruel, actually, in, the, in, in academic life. So it's a very strange mixture of uh, you know, competition and uh, cooperation. Yes, um, well, Katarina, I'm, that's actually one of the things I'm thinking about for in the context of the theory of play and the agent types. And there's also some work in game theory, in fact even in cognitive science, on what are the most common types of agent types. And what you will then be looking at is, for instance, equilibria in populations which have both types of players. Now, um, uh, I don't have very strong results on this, but uh, what you're probably also driving it at is what would happen if you took that to logic? So suppose that I start modulating these logic games and put in competitive, right? For instance, the evaluation game is competitive, right? What if I put in a certain measure of cooperation? Uh, I would find that very interesting, but uh, I haven't arrived at any definite results. So I'm totally with you. I think it suggests a lot of interesting questions, but I don't think it takes it outside of logic. It would just make things richer. And I just want to say back to Aristotle, since you were mentioning Aristotle at the beginning, Aristotle has a very interesting, has some very interesting observations in the topics about the, these games that are precisely both adversarial and cooperative. So you might want to look into that uh, for yes. inspiration. Yes. Oh, thank you. Yes, yes. Of course, if I could quote Aristotle on my side, I wouldn't even have to give lectures, right? Yeah, so I mean, I'll just give you the quote and yeah, yeah. you're good. Yeah, no, but I, uh, yeah, I, I think that's interesting. Here. Well, I don't know how, who chose. Here is one. Okay. Oh, yes. So you talked about logic and play, and you said logic and games, and you say in a little bit of computer science. Right? This was one yeah, of yeah. your slides. And I want to challenge you on that, because I believe that if you look today, where the most intensive work is happening about logic and games, it is in computer science, actually. That's where things come to fall. Yeah. Um, well, uh, this is part of it. Yeah, I agree with that. So it's like this, Moshe, for the, uh, so to speak, the rhetorical setup of this talk, I talked about logic and games. Actually, I think of it as a sort of triangle between logic, games, and computation. But I've noticed with audiences, that gets too complicated to get it across, but I'm totally with you. Uh, some of the most innovative work of the sort that I'm interested in is actually done in various computer science communities. Actually, in my book in Logic and Games, 
I actually do point that out with full vigor, so to speak. So my footnote was just small for the purpose of this talk. But uh, I'm totally with you. And I also think that, uh, you know, um, a lot of the work done in computational logic and, and studies of games there is of direct relevance to uh, what I'm saying about this theory of play. For instance, automata, theoretic approaches, uh, uh, games where the solutions are memory free, the positional determinacy th theorem. We haven't even begun to understand what that would actually mean for, uh, you know, and we have to for a general study of logic and agency. Well, uh, there's an element in the presentation you gave today that uh, uh, was, was simply assumed, uh, namely the identity, fixed identity of the players. And one way to incorporate uh, uh, the threads of uh, co uh, cooperation and the interplay with uh, competition is to allow for changes in how you view the identity of the players. So uh, either a suggestion or a request for thoughts, uh, maybe this, likely this is something you, you've already thought about. No, this is a very good about. point. Uh, okay, so in my presentation, and actually also in my book, I, I stick to what's probably an unwarranted limitation of current multi-agent logics. So the agents are just indices and they stand for some sort of fixed so it's a sort of rigid uh, designators through various situations. Um, uh, it's, it probably would be a much better model to think of the agents as developing themselves. Uh, one thing I've played with is actually to think of the agents as themselves being affected by the updates. So that it wouldn't be about what the same agent knows after getting the information, but it would actually be what the changed agent, sadder but wiser, so to speak, thinks after receiving the update. Uh, and one area, actually, it will also be represented at a workshop uh, uh, this week where this plays very significantly is if you think of group agents. More than with single agents, if you do these logics for group agents, groups have to change. That's what they do all the time. Yeah, 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 very good. Yeah, so I think that's a very exciting and probably also correct way to go. The agents themselves have to become dynamic. Welcome. <clears throat> Hi. Yeah. Uh, okay, I, uh, if you go uh, two slides back, um, you, uh, there was this um, characterization that logic is normative, and uh, one okay, yeah, and it, as if and you sort of imply that it's not prescriptive. But I would like to challenge you here because I think that being uh, the descriptions, formulas are very essential logic. I mean, computation theory, it's a description of uh, computation. Moral theory, the theory of definable sets. Set theory, descriptive set theory. This is the concept of definability, which I think goes right to the heart of the use of logic. In fact, if, I th if, if a mathematician outside logic came to me and asked, what can logic offer in, in mathematics? I would say, oh, it gives these descriptions which help you because, I mean, definable sets are back measurable and you have comp some solutions are recursive and some are not and so forth. So I think there's a lot in logic which is descriptive and is normative. It's very, very, very small part. I like that point. I'd like to discuss it further with you. The idea that uh, logic is actually descriptive of, let's say, even fewer parts of mathematical logic are descriptive of what, say, certain mathematical communities do. I, I find that very interesting. Um, uh, there is, of course, a little danger uh, here, Yoko, because if you do that, uh, mathematicians could ask uh, whether logic is a correct description, not in the sense of normativity. But it, for instance, uh, I once taught a joint course in Amsterdam with uh, Robert Dijkraaf. Robert is a mathematical physicist, uh, more in strength theory, but uh, we share an interest in methodology and, and, and uh, things like that. So we co-taught on the same subjects. And um, uh, uh, one of the topics we talked about was mathematical proof. And I told Robert what, something about, I told him something about proof theory, and he was shocked. So he said, that's what you logicians think that a mathematical proof is. And he said, yes, for the first time, can a model of mathematical proof be more wrong than the idea of a sequence of formulas, right? Then, so now we're talking about, about maybe the most prominent Dutch mathematician. He said, to me, a proof is a series of ideas falling into place. There are certain important moments, which he calls click moments, where you feel 
that you have the natural next step, and it's far removed from anything you model by sequences or formulas. So at least his thinking was that proof theory would still have a lot of work to do before it actually got closer to what a mathematician himself, or our top mathematician, top most creative mathematicians actually think a proof is. But that's the risk you run, but it's an interesting risk. Uh, we have a question at the back. <coughs> Thanks. So, uh, when you were talking about the law of distribution, you were saying that logical equivalence boils down to the notion of sameness of games. And uh, you also said that there are different notions of sameness of games that can apply depending on the level of generality, etc. So, should we regard that as an argument for logical pluralism? So, should we think that there is not one correct notion of logical equivalence or logical consequence? Thank you. Also very good. By the way, Yoko, I'd like to pursue this conversation. So, so nothing I said disagreed. I think we could get a lot more out of this. Anyway, now, yes, it's at least an interesting line to, to, to think about. Um, if you, for instance, you could ask yourself the following question. Suppose that I go to a finer notion of game equivalence. I will get another notion of validity in propositional logic. Right? Because, uh, say, distribution isn't valid, but some things presumably will be valid. Um, uh, what I see that as related to is uh, very old discussions in uh, the history also of logic itself, for instance, into the nature of propositions. For instance, are P and Q or R, and P and Q or P and R the same proposition or not? Right? Uh, there's this whole literature on thinking that maybe not, although some validities would be. Uh, so, yeah, I think we're going to have an, actually a very interesting uh, duality of... Um, uh, so you could look at things in two ways. One is ever finer game equivalences, one is a sort of hierarchy of logics. And uh, to mention one particular result, which is actually my book, is if you go towards a bit more uh, refined uh, equivalence in predicate logic, that's a bit startling, it becomes decidable. Take that. Um, <coughs> Okay. Here. <clears throat> Thank you. I wanted to know how intuitionistic logic gets related to the study of uh, uh, games. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so, for instance, you might think I started heavily emphasizing excluded middle when I talked about Zermelo. Actually, that's not a difference because in the Zermelo case, we're talking about finite games. And, of course, excluded middle is okay intuitionistically uh, on, on finite objects. But, um, yeah, it, it's interesting to look at these things intuitionistically. I haven't uh, thought about it very systematically. But, for instance, one line might be this, that if you look at that power perspective, uh, this I'll just say, it's actually a sort of topological view of games. These uh, powers that the players reach, those sets of outcomes, are like a sort of open sets. And of course, through the topological interpretation of intuitionistic logic, you might expect analogies there. So I think that's a good line. This one. <clears throat> Um, so I have a question to this slide. So you say that um, in this cognitive psychology, right, um, the logic will be describing um, issues that comes from discoveries from cognitive psychology, right? Uh, that mistakes, emotions, maybe those animal models um, of uh, mindless animals. And I was wondering whether the other way around it would work as well. So when you look at the research of cognitive scientists, they will be describing that humans have some core cognition, that they uh, know some things without really knowing because this knowledge or kind of knowledge comes before the language comes. So there's like no computations on those knowledge. Uh, so I was wondering whether that was studied uh, or that was taken into account in the um, studies that you presented. Not that I know, but uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting suggestion. So I, I feel on the whole, uh, the interface between logic and cognitive science is only just starting. So there were two decades of sniping, right, where cognitive psychologists pointed out to logicians that they were wrong about everything and that humans don't do this. I think we're past that phase now. <laughs> but uh, uh, what's only just starting is serious um, 
contacts. And of course, you would expect them in both directions. <laughs> um, uh, for instance, findings in cognitive science uh, might also um, uh, uh, you know, lead us to uh, maybe new developments in logic, if that's what you're suggesting. Uh, for instance, uh, one uh, current thing, uh, which... How, how to do that, whether there's core cognitive knowledge yeah. be taken like axioms or something yeah. or something which is yeah. like stable and other things yeah. happen after yeah. on top well, of it. Okay, so I, I can't really give a long answer, but to, to, to take an example, uh, when you fly to Finland, there's this bestseller, right, uh, Fast and Slow Thinking by Kahneman. Of course, eventually you can't help, you've exhausted all detective novels, so you also pick up Kahneman. And actually, I know many logicians who are intrigued by this. Couldn't we introduce this into logical systems? So to have the, you know, uh, uh, that's of course an idea from cognitive science, but it seems to make perfect sense also from a logical point of view, but how to model it, how to actually get it into, uh, uh, so just as a concrete example of what, what I would consider a serious contact. Okay, I think we have now come to the end point of this discussion and as a payoff for the lecture, I have a small present for you. Oh. Thank you, Ilko. Thank you.